Let's start with this subject of psychoanalysis, this divided or split subject. Now, there are lots of ways for us to arrive at this individual. Um, let's start with the easiest, most simple way of this. It's one you've probably heard before. So there you are. You're a newborn infant. You're crying out. Whenever something is off, you just cry about it. It doesn't mean that you know what you're crying about. It just means that something feels off. Hunger feels off. Being cold feels off. Being tired feels off and all produce the same effect, namely a cry. The child starts crying when they're uncomfortable and the primary caregiver or whomever is taking care of you shows up and ideally tries to address the cause of your crying. They might guess that you're cold and bring you a blanket. If you're still crying, they'll realize they guessed wrong and try something else, perhaps food. If they feed you and you're not interested, then maybe they think sleep and then they try and get you to sleep and they work through all the possible meanings of your cry. Now you don't know what your cry means, except that you're uncomfortable. They're trying to guess the action that they can perform that will satisfy the need, the biomaterialistic, animalistic, embodied need, being cold, being hungry, being tired, these are all bodily phenomena, that caused you to cry. Now, when they do that, they're doing a couple of things. First, they're interpreting your cry. They're assigning meaning to it. Over time, though, the child can learn that when I cry, mommy or daddy or grandma or grandpa or whoever takes care of you shows up with food. They can learn that the meaning of the cry is food. They can learn that whatever you show up with on a regular basis is the meaning of the cry. Over time, though, the primary caregiver starts to tell the growing child that crying is no longer sufficient. They now need to use their words, words that the primary caregiver has probably been speaking to the infant every single time they showed up with a blanket. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you cold? Here's a blanket for you. Let's get you wrapped up. Let's get you bundled up. Oh, tired baby. Let's help you get to sleep. Oh, baby's hungry. Okay, here's some food for you. Mm, you like that? Mm, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? So there's all this language that comes with the satisfaction of material need. Over time, the primary caregiver gets tired of responding to cries and the child develops enough skill to be able to articulate or express their needs in language. That is a demand in Lacanian terms. A demand is a need expressed in language. Initially, it was the primary caregiver's job to take the expression of need at the level of a cry and integrate it into the field of language, thereby rendering it a demand by interpreting that cry and guessing what the child might need in that moment, whether it's a blanket to keep them warm, some food to satisfy their hunger, some rocking in order to help them sleep. Now, over time though, the primary caregiver starts to ask the child to go ahead and do that work for them. Don't just cry when you have a need, express it in language, use your words. So you can hear primary caregivers, parents, whomever, telling the child, I can't understand you when you cry like that. It's, I, don't, I can't help you unless you can calm down, take a deep breath and tell me what it is that's on your mind. Tell me what it is that's bothering you. And the kid will try and do this, usually caught up in their embodied, affectively intense experience in that moment that produces the cry. And they're rather disembodied pressure to put that into words, into an abstract symbolic system that the primary caregiver is already enmeshed in and can then use to help the child ostensibly. And so you see kids in this moment doing a lot of, uh, I just can't help it, he, 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 he. And you may even remember this experience. You're so upset, you're crying, but you're trying to force it into words. And you're struggling. It's a jumbled, stammering discourse, but a discourse nonetheless. That discourse is a demand. 
It's a demand because you're taking the very embodied experience of need, which is biological, materialistic, animalistic, and you are mediating it in and through language, in and through what language supports social order, relationships, intersubjective relationships with other people in a socially constituted and linguistically propped up world. Now, eventually you get access to all of that. You still experience bodily need as you do right now. You can still feel hungry and tired and hot and so all of these things. But you now have access in a very fluent way to language. And if you're really good at this stuff, you're able to take how you're feeling as an embodied subject and put it into words that other people can understand and work with. This is pretty crucial, especially in relationships where you have some affective and emotional issues that you can then put into words, sentences that begin with, I feel, I feel statements. That is helpful to partners, to friends, to family members, because they don't know what it's like to have your body, to be inside your skin. They don't know that pain. They don't know what it feels like. Bodily pain is private. It's at the level of language that it can be pressed out, expressed, and shared with another person. As this process is developing, though, it creates a split subject. A subject that is divided between the bio-animalistic field of need and the socio-linguistic field of demand. There it is. The split subject fundamentally when it emerges out of early childhood is a subject that is no longer strictly immersed in the here and now of the process of the all in eternal becoming. They are now brought into this world of language where they now have a foot in each camp. They are still in part that bio-animalistic infant because they still have a body that experiences need. But now they're also acutely aware of this other field, this field of language in which need can be represented at the level of a signifier, at the level of a word. So this is also how the splitting of the subject occurs. They went from a world that was logically presupposed, because we don't really know what this was like, because there was no language to tell us about it. But the pre-linguistic environment of the infant is one of presence, presence alone. In the field of language, you have presence and absence. Things can be missing in the field of language where they can't in the field of animality. That's a really important move here. Because in the field of language, I can talk about burrito, elephant, bicycle. I can name all of these things that aren't physically present in the room, yours or mine. But nevertheless, I can make them present in the field of language. With language, you can talk about, represent, and call to mind. You can make present, via language, things that are in actuality, in physicality, and materiality missing or absent. So part of what happens when the child is inducted into language is that they are also introduced to something other than presence, namely absence, to the way that something can be missing or lacking. That can only occur in the field of language for reasons that we can talk about elsewhere. But for now, let's stick with that very basic sense of splitting. When the child is inducted into the symbolic, into the field of language, they're asked to hold two senses of self. There's an embodied, need-based, biomaterialistic self, which is your body. And then there is this disembodied, linguistic, socialized, kind of abstract self. 
You'll hear Lacan distinguishing these between the enunciating subject, which is the subject that feels the urge to speak, and the grammatical subject, which is the subject or the part of the self that is represented in the field of language. So, for instance, there we are in a conversation, and there's some urge that I have to tell you about myself. And I might say in that conversation, I'm the kind of person who likes to stay up late and watch TV. The question at that point is, what is it about me in that moment as an embodied enunciating speaker that caused me to want to show up and present myself to you as a specific kind of person, namely somebody who stays up late and watches TV? You see, there's the part of me that felt the urge to say that, and then there's the part of me that is spoken, represented, and displayed for your approval, ideally, at the level of language. So even in that very basic experience, anytime you use a sentence with the vertical pronoun I, there's a split subjectivity at play there. There's the impulse to speak that is on the side of embodiment, and then there's what is said, the way that you're represented at the level of language. This splitting constantly occurs. But to suggest that there are only two elements in this is incorrect. The basic equation that you have to hold in mind here is that one plus one in Lacanian terms does not equal two. Instead, it equals three. 